All right, so today's part two of something we started discussing last month, and I always have a little disclaimer that the information on this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. All content, including text, graphics, images, and information is for general information and education purposes only. Feel free to ask questions, or you can post in the chat, or you can unmute yourselves and you know, just ask the question during the presentation. Let's try to stick to the topic because we have a lot of information. I want to make sure I talk about everything before the chef comes uh, to do his part. So last month, we started discussing some nutrients of concern um, for a plant-based diet. And I like to say concern, quote unquote, because after today's presentation, you're going to find out that really these nutrients should be a concern for everybody that is trying to eat healthy. So those are things we need to pay attention and, and um, be mindful as we plan the foods we eat throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, to make sure we are not getting at risk for any deficiency. So last month we discussed protein, zinc, calcium, and iron. And today we're gonna talk about omega-3, vitamin D, iodine, and vitamin B12, and why there has been some concerns uh, for those to follow a vegan or vegetarian diet that may be at risk for being deficient on those nutrients. Um, starting with omega-3, if that's a type of fat, so fatty acid, it's an essential fat, and it has been associated with a myriad of health benefits. It's required for brain and retinal development, so it's very critical for the fetal development during pregnancy. It's very critical for cognitive function. So, as you know, as we get older, that's something we want to preserve. So, having enough omega three on board, make sure you're preserving your cognitive function is one of the features that can help you preserve your cognitive function. It's very important for immune function for the nervous system function, cell membrane structure, and it has anti-inflammatory properties. So a lot of health benefits we don't wanna be missing out. It has also been associated with the decreased risk of chronic diseases when we get enough omega-3. Uh, one thing that maybe not everybody knows is there are several types of omega-3s, not just one type. So they are subdivided into alpha-linolenic acid, steroidonic acid, eicosapentaenoic acid, maybe I should just say the abbreviations just, you know, so I don't say this long name. So EPA, the AHA, and DPA. So those are the five types of omega-3 fatty acids that we have. And I highlighted EPA and DHA because those are the elongated forms of omega-3 fatty acids that have been associated with some specific health benefits. And because they are mainly found in fatty fish and microalgae, um, there is a concern that those who follow a plant-based diet may be not getting sufficient amounts. And there are some studies that actually have measured the amount of omega-3 fatty acids in vegans and vegetarians. And they have found that they have lower levels compared to those who eat uh, fish, especially. However, all the studies follow and they show that they have not been seeing very, you know, critical outcomes or any concerns, clinical concerns. But I think it's important for us, nonetheless, to try to follow the recommendations and try to make sure we get an adequate amount of omega-3. Uh, you can also make EPA and DHA, which are those two forms of uh, omega-3 that I said that have been associated with special health benefits. You can get them from ALA, which is the basic plant form of omega-3. There is a process that happens inside the body and uses a certain enzyme that can get the, that form of ALA to transform into EPA and DHA, and those are the final substances that can lead to a lot of anti-inflammatory um, substances. So it's, it's something that your, our body can form, some EPA and some DHA, even if you're not getting them preformed in foods. But this process is dependent on certain factors. 
So it depends on your dietary choices, especially because omega-6, in order for you to make EPA and DHA from the basic ALA, it uses the same enzyme that omega-6 uses to elongate its basic form called linoleic acid. So I hope I'm not boring you with all this biochemical um, information, but it's just to show that it's a process that happens inside the body, but it's regulated. There are other things that can interfere with this process. So we're gonna talk about how can we minimize the things that can interfere and we can maximize um, forming EPA and DJ. So dietary choices is one of them, and we're gonna break down into what foods in particular we can help reduce to make this process easier. Genetics, that's something we cannot change. So there are some people that are gonna be making BA and DHA more efficiently. Gender, there are some studies that found that young males uh, have a harder time with this process of conversion of ALA into EPA and DHA versus younger females. Uh, the presence of chronic diseases, so those who have diabetes, heart disease, um, or any other chronic condition, they also don't have this process going very efficiently. Uh, and smoking. So there are things that we can control, but there are things we cannot control. So genetics and gender, there's nothing we can do about it, but the other factors, there are things we can do about it. So how can we guarantee producing more EPA and DHA? So one of the things we wanna make sure is that we have a regular intake of ALA rich plant sources because that's the basic substrate to make EPA and DHA in the body. And we're gonna talk about the foods uh, coming up that can be good sources of ALA. Also, we need to adopt certain dietary modifications to facilitate the conversion of ALA into EPA and DHA. And for those who are not doing those two processes efficiently, there's also an option of taking an algae-based EPA and DHA supplement as needed. And there are certain circumstances that this supplement is more critical and is more critical during pregnancy, um, pregnancy and lactation. So during this time, um, those who are vegan or vegetarians are especially encouraged to take an um, algae-based supplement that offers 200 to 300 milligrams of EPA and DHA per day. It's also recommended for the elderly and for those with chronic diseases. So this chart has the daily omega-3 needs um, from ALA because you don't, find, you don't find EPA and DHA in the most common food sources that we get. You find them in microalgae. So we don't find those microalgae available in the supermarket. We find them in the supplement form. So in terms of foods that provide omega-3, we find them in the form of ALA. So your needs are in this chart. So I'm not gonna read one by one here. You're gonna have this as a reference to either watch this presentation again as it's being recorded, or you can refer to the article that is going to be posted on the NAG page and you can use this as a reference. But I'm gonna be using myself as an example, you know, so that I can have something practical to, you know, compare to. So for my age group, I need about 1.1 grams of ALA per day. So let's look at some of the foods that are rich in ALA. So we have walnuts, we have flaxseed and flaxseed oil, chia seeds, hemp seeds, canola oil, um, tofu and edamame and all the soy products also contain omega-3 and anything that is derived from these basic foods you can also um, get some ELA type of omega-3. So it's not very difficult to get your ELA needs for the day so for myself if I consume one tablespoon of chia seed or flaxseed I can actually exceed what the ALA amount that I need. And that, those two sources tend to be what I more regularly consume as far as omega-3 sources. Um, so you can see that you don't need to do too much to get the basic amount of ALA you need. Um, very important also to recommend, and this is a picture of a coffee grinder, 
please disregard the coffee. Co coffee is actually not recommended. It's one of the things that should be avoided to maximize the conversion of APA into DAJ. I mean, ALA into EPA and DAJ. But this is just to show that your flag seeds, when they are whole, you actually don't absorb the, the omega-3s in them very efficiently. So it's recommended that you grind them. And I prefer to grind them fresh because omega-3 types of fats, they are very unstable, very prone to oxidation. So you wanna keep them intact when you're not using them. And even better, you wanna keep them refrigerated. All these food sources here is better to uh, keep them refrigerated. And when you're gonna use the flax seed, then you grind it fresh. So that's why the small coffee grinder comes in handy. And that's a picture of the one I have. Um, so it's just, you know, an, act, an additional step to facilitate the absorption of the omega-3s uh, from flax seed. Uh, in terms of supplements, those are two supplements that I find that have pretty good uh, rating. Uh, as you know, the supplement industry is not regulated by the FDA, so you need to go by what works, what doesn't work, and you can do that based on your labs. So if you happen to want to measure your omega-3 levels, you can, if they're low, you can take supplements and you can ask your doctors to measure them again. So this one on the left is the one that, you know, we've been using here at home. And I tend to use them mostly on days that I'm not consuming my chia seeds or flax seeds or any other source of omega-3. Um, so I don't need to, I don't take those supplements on a daily basis more, you know, just, you know, to fill the gap in days that I'm not consuming omega-3 rich sources. So let's talk about some of the dietary modifications that can help you convert your ALA to EPA and DHA more efficiently. So one of them is, if you remember, I said the omega-3s and omega-6, they both use the same enzymes to form all the substances. So if you reduce your intake of omega-6 rich foods, especially from oils, and the oils that are rich in omega-6 will be corn oil, safflower oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, and peanut oil. So the reason I mentioned omega-6 from oils is because oils tend to concentrate, I mean, they don't tend to, they do concentrate the fats quite a bit compared to the whole food. So you still need to consume some sources of omega-6 because it is an essential fat as well, but it's better to consume those sources from whole foods so instead of the corn oil, using the corn, instead of the soybean oil, using soybean products, instead of sunflower oil, eating some sunflower seeds, and so on and so forth, because now you have a more diluted amount of omega-6, and you have the fibers that helps that not all the fat is absorbed to begin with. So those are some considerations, um, one of the modifications that we can do. Also avoiding alcohol or caffeine as they tend and they, they reduce the body's ability to convert ALA. Avoiding trans fats, which can be found in hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils. And it's something that you can refer on the label of products. Um, keeping in mind that trans fats have been banned from processed foods in the US the past few years, but that's something that as if we travel overseas, it's, it's good to be mindful, you know, to read the labels of foods and find, look, you know, try to stay away from hydrogenated oils. It's very important also to consume a diet that includes a variety of healthy plant-based foods, because if your diet is deficient in protein, vitamins, and minerals, especially if it's deficient in niacin, pyridoxine, and vitamin C, or this deficient on zinc and magnesium, it can also affect this process of conversion of your omega-3s because it affects the enzymes that are required for this process. So eating a healthy diet is always going to be the basis for everything to work well. Some experts also suggest that if you're not taking an um, algae-based supplement, you should double your intake of the ALA form of the omega-3. So you can go back to that table that will list your daily needs for omega-3, and you double that if you're not one that is consuming the supplements. 
Okay, and this just to make the point, um, uh, in terms of reducing the intake of omega-6 rich foods from oils, this is important also to pay attention to processed foods. Because processed foods, if you start reading the labels, you're going to find out that a lot of them use these types of oils. Okay, so let's look at one example here. Pringles, potato chips. So if you look at the oils we talked about before, that should be reduced, corn oil. And let's look at the ingredients list on Pringles. All right, corn oil is right here. Next one, cotton seed, which is on our list. Soybean oil on our list and sunflower oil on our list too. So a lot of processed foods, they gravitate towards either using saturated fats or omega-6 fats in their products because they're more shelf stable. They don't, they don't oxidize as easily as omega-3. Um, so if you eat a lot of processed foods, you're gonna be, your ratio of omega-6 is not gonna be favorable for you to make more EPA and DNJ. All right, before I switch gears, let me see, do we have any questions on, on the chat, Phil? Nope, I don't see any. All right, so let's move to the next nutrient, vitamin D. So vitamin D what is a fat. Oil? So coconut oil is high in saturated fats. So it's more on the list to be avoided. It doesn't have any omega-3s or omega-6. But you know, if you look at another like another presentation we had um, talking about fats in general, coconut oil is something that we recommend um, that we avoid, that we should avoid. All right, vitamin D. So vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. And let's look at the what are the health benefits from vitamin D? So it helps with calcium absorption in the gut. It, it is involved in bone growth, remodeling and mineralization, immune function, cell growth, modulation, reduction of inflammation. So vitamin D has anti-inflammatory properties, uh, is involved in glucose metabolism and neuromuscular function. What are some good sources of vitamin D? So I gave a hint with the previous slide. Sunlight is a great source, but the next slide we're gonna discuss that there are some things that can interfere with the production of vitamin C uh, from sunlight exposure. Um, naturally occurring, you can find vitamin D in fatty fish, um, fish liver oil, mushrooms that are exposed to UV light. So not all types of mushrooms, you need to look at the label and the label needs to inform you like this one here that says excellent source of vitamin D. And when you look at the vitamin D um, daily value here, the, you can see that a serving of two thirds of a cup of this mushroom here provides 50% of your daily needs of vitamin D. So mushroom can be something that you can use as one of your sources of vitamin D. But again, you wanna make sure you have something regular coming on board. So if you're okay with eating mushrooms every day, uh, this type of mushroom, that would be uh, one of the sources, but we, wanna, we don't wanna depend on just one source. We can get vitamin D also from fortified dietary sources. So it's found in milk and that's cow's milk that a lot of people think is naturally occurring in cow's milk, but it's not. It's fortified into cow's milk. The same way it is fortified into plant-based milk and yogurt substitutes. You can find in some breakfast cereals, some brands of orange juice and some other fruit products. So really, it's referring to the label to find out what products are fortified or not. <clears throat> and then you can also get vitamin D from supplements, either in the form of vitamin D2 or vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is the form that you, you get from plant sources. Vitamin D3 is the form that you get more commonly from animal sources. They tend to harvest from, from the sheep, sheep skin uh, to make vitamin D3. But you can find some sources that are plant-based. So just make sure the label, the product indicates. So those are, you know, some, I'm just highlighting a couple of products here as examples. 
All right, so let's talk about some considerations if you get your vitamin D from sunlight, which is a great source because once the UVB rays hit your skin, the cholesterol that is under the skin um, gets transformed into a preform of vitamin D, and then it gets it needs to be activated by your liver and by your kidney be before it turns into an active form of vitamin D. So the vitamin D production from sunlight is also dependent on the time of the day. So if you go for a walk at 7 a.m., even if the sun is up, that angle of the sun is not going to be enough to stimulate the vitamin D production on your skin. So the sun needs to be at an angle of at least 45 degrees. And that can vary slightly depending on the time of the year. So I'm going to share a map that can help you track the best time of the day for you to expose um, your skin to sunlight if you want to get some vitamin D production. The latitude where you live, so how far you are from the equator. So the closer you are from the, to the equator, the more stable the sunlight exposure you have. So the farther you are, then you can have more variability depending on the season. So winter season, um, not only we tend to have shorter uh, sunlight, but also we tend to bundle up so we don't expose much of the skin uh, during winter. Air pollution can also act as a filter from those UVB rays, so that can also be interfering with your vitamin D production. Uh, skin coverage with clothes, so if you go for a walk at 10 a.m., even if the angle of the sun is pretty good, to hit your skin, but if you have long sleeves and pants, um, you don't have enough skin exposed. So the recommendation, especially if the weather is good, try to wear, you know, something that exposes good parts of your legs and your arms. You can protect your face because UV, uh, you can also get damage from too much sun, especially wrinkles. So you can protect your face and you can expose, you know, your arms and your legs. As we age, we also tend to convert less vitamin D from sunlight. So that's something also to take into consideration and skin pigmentation. So darker skin tones need to stay longer to get the same vitamin production that somebody with a lighter skin tone. So some of the experts recommend that you base the amount of time to be exposed for your skin type on roughly half the time that you get you to get a, a burn on your skin. So each person kind of needs to estimate. Uh, for myself, I tend to go for my walks, you know, because I'm working from home, I take a break and I go on my walks around 10, 30, 11 a.m. And I walk for about half an, half an hour and my skin is fine without sunblock during this period of time. So each person can see how much they can tolerate or how much you have actually time to expose to enough sunlight. It doesn't need to be every day for you to get enough vitamin D for the week, but at least three times a week, getting enough for your skin tone. Okay, so this is the app I wanted to refer you guys to that you can put all the information, your age, where you live, and the type of skin uh, you have, and it can give you tips on the best time each day and how long you should be exposing your skin to the sun to get it off vitamin D. It's a free app, so if you guys want to try, if you like technology to help you with those decisions, that's something you can try. There's also some information coming up on vitamin D and COVID-19. So last year, there, was a, there were a lot of studies pointing that there is a link between vitamin D insufficiency and a high risk of a severe case of COVID-19. Several studies came up and the more recent study that I found um, was a meta-analysis, so a systematic review of all the clinical trials. It hasn't even been published officially yet, but it's available online. And they concluded that vitamin D supplementation may be uh, helpful and it can improve clinical outcomes uh, for those that got COVID-19, um, there, there is some debate as far as the appropriate dose and the duration of this um, therapy and how to administer the vitamin D because each study, they were not using the same dose. 
but um, they found in common that vitamin D is pointing in the direction of being helpful um, to, uh, to one of the treatments that can help prevent a severe case of COVID-19. So what is the best source of vitamin D? I like to use this one as much as I can. And there's evidence that people with higher vitamin D, vitamin D levels that is naturally produced when your skin is exposed to the UVB light from the sun, um, that they have a reduced risk of even catching COVID-19 and a less severe outcome if they do contract the virus. Um, experts, if you were to test your vitamin D to see if you are in the good zone or if you are in the deficient zone, the experts recommend that if you test your vitamin D blood level or the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, that your level should be 40 to 60 for optimal um, health outcomes. They say that above 20, it's good to prevent some deficiencies, but you want to be on the optimal level to, to have better health outcomes. And this information is from the Vitamin D Society. And we do have this council that has been given to, to us many years ago from Ellen White, that she says, exercise even free abundant use of the air and sunlight on um, blessings which heaven has bestowed upon all would in many cases give life and strength to the emaciated invalid. So that's from the book, Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 160. And that was advice from the um, year 1890. Um, what groups are at risk for vitamin D deficiency? So some vegetarians or vegans, they, some studies have been found that they were low in vitamin D and the latter groups, especially during winter or spring, or those who live in high altitudes. Uh, groups uh, or individuals, they are obese, also they have a high risk for vitamin D deficiency. Uh, those who suffer from Crohn's disease, celiac disease, ulcerative colitis, liver or kidney disease, as I mentioned before, those two organs are required to, uh, to transfer the vitamin D that you get either from sunlight or from foods and or supplements into, a, a, into an active form. So patients that suffer from liver kidney failure or chronic kidney or liver disease, they're gonna be a high risk of vitamin D deficiency. So they need special supplements. Um, breastfed infants need to supplement old, old age. So the elderly needs to supplement. Those with darker skin should, you know, pay special attention and do your labs regularly to make sure you're not deficient. Um, in groups that wear covering clothes that prevent the exposure of the skin to sunlight. And we are talking about some religious groups that uh, promote, you know, covering the, the, the arms and, and the legs at all times. So some of those groups, some of those individuals may be at risk for vitamin D deficiency as well. Um, and those who are irregularly exposing themselves, themselves to sunshine are also at risk. So in terms of the vitamin D daily needs, daily needs you have in this chart that again is gonna be available um, on the article that is going to be posted. So looking at my age group here, I need about 600 international units a day, or if you're looking labels, give you also information in micrograms. So if I were to get these from foods, that's how much you can get from the mushrooms that are exposed to UV light. And sorry that I bend it up up here, but you can get this much from mushrooms. Uh, when it comes to fortified foods, you can get not much, so 100 to 144 international units from a typical survey. So it's important to refer to the label, not all um, plant-based foods are going to be fortified. This is one of the soy milks that is fortified with vitamin D from Costco. Uh, and the image is kind, kind of tiny here, but you can see when you read the vitamin D levels that it can give you, I think it's 25% of your daily needs in, in a survey. 
All right, so before I switch to iodine, do we have any questions on vitamin D? So we had one question, which you actually addressed, but you might want to go back over it, but the difference between vitamin D and D3. Yeah, so we have D3 and D2. So D2 is mainly found in plant sources, D3 mainly found in animal sources. Um, they both can help your levels to stay uh, where they need to be, so they're both efficient. Um, you find some sources of D3 in plants, but you need to refer to the label. If the label doesn't tell you, um, you assume the D3 you're looking at is from an animal source. Any other questions, though? No? Okay. I have a yes. question. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was told that um, uh, windows actually block the... Um, um, good, the good um, rays from the sun. And I didn't know if, if that was true. I never really looked into it. So even if you stand by uh, your kitchen window and just trying to enjoy some of the sunlight, uh, I was told it's best to go out and have nothing that's blocking the sunlight from, from hitting your face and your body. So I just wanted to find out if that's accurate. That is actually true. So uh, glass and windows are gonna block the UVB rays. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, so switching gear to iodine. So iodine is responsible, is one of the components to make the three, three, T, T3 and T4, T4 thyroid hormones. So they are key for thyroid function. And these hormones, the thyroid hormones are involved in protein synthesis, the skeletal and central nervous system development in fetuses and infants and many metabolic activities throughout the body. So iodine deficiency will lead to goiter because the thyroid gland is going to expand as it's trying to keep up with the demands of not having enough iodine to make those hormones. So goiter is one of the side effects or, or one of the consequences of iodine deficiency. Uh, hypothyroidism, that is one of the causes of hypothyroidism. And you can have pregnancy-related problems, uh, including mental retardation or for the infant if, if the mother doesn't get sufficient iodine. So that's something very important to pay attention to. The recommendation, uh, the daily needs. I'm gonna look again at my age group here. So I need about 150 micrograms a day. The sources of iodine include some foods. So it's naturally occurring in seafood and seaweed. Uh, so for those who follow a plant-based diet, we are left with just the second option. But again, you would have to consume that regularly to make sure you're getting enough iodine from that source. Um, it's also fortified into table salt and sea salt. You can get some iodized sea salt. And each quarter of a teaspoon typically provides close to 50% of your daily needs. So if you're using iodine sea salt or sea salt, you probably fine with your iodine intake. If you cook at home, I have to add that because if you, if you have those salts sitting in your cabinet that you eat mostly processed foods or foods you buy, you know, like TV dinners, those type of things, the processed foods, they don't use the iodized salt. So you would still be, need to be mindful of getting some other form of iodine. So you can also get that in supplements. So in terms of plant-based sources, we are left, like I said, with seaweed. So the different types of seaweeds are listed here. Um, some of them actually have way too much. You wanna be careful of not going to the other extreme and getting too much iodine, because then it can cause hyperthyroidism. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna eat extreme. You wanna get the amount you need? No, I mean, if it's slightly more, slightly less, it should be fine. But things like kelp that you can get 2000 micrograms in a tablespoon, that's probably something you don't wanna consume too frequently. Uh, the other types of seaweeds listed here have a little bit less. Uh, hiziki is a type that I put a master here that have been found to also be high in arsenic. So it's not something that you wanna consume frequently. Um, because arsenic has, can increase the risk for cancer. Um, the nori type of seaweed, that's the type that they use for sushi, and that's the type we find of those seaweed snacks. So the only thing is that snacks, I was looking at the label, 
because I buy the seaweeds that's uh, from Costco, they don't list how much iodine is in them. So, but I kind of estimated based on the weight um, on the package. And I did the calculation that you can, if you eat the whole package, you can get about 388 micrograms of iodine. So it's good for a few days. You don't, you shouldn't be eating this um, too much. So you don't get uh, excess amount of iodine. Um, this is a product I found at Trader Joe's and because I like to try different things, as I saw this sea seasoning that is has an excellent source of iodine, it's from kelp. But when I look at the back, I saw that it provides a teaspoon, provides over a thousand percent of your daily needs. So I was like, oh, okay, I better be careful with that now. Um, so I tried just to see if it enhances the flavor. So I make the, the fake tuna, the mock tuna spread with garbanzo bean. And I added a quarter of a teaspoon. And that was to, you know, for my husband and myself to eat. Um, I didn't find that it enhances the flavor much at all, maybe because the amount is so tiny. But on the other hand, I didn't want to use too much and get into any problems with my thyroid, even if it was something, you know, that I use, a, that I was going to use occasionally. So um, I'm probably going to just use this one time until I finish this. And it's going to take me a few years, ago, I guess, to finish this up. So I better look at the, the expiration date. Um, so it's not something that I think is very useful because it's too concentrated. So what groups are at risk for iodine deficiency? So vegans and vegetarians who do not consume iodized salt or seaweed regularly uh, can be at risk. Um, you can find some iodine from other fruits and vegetables, but because the amount in the soil can vary quite a bit, it's not a source that has been uh, recommended to depend on. So vegan women of childbearing age are encouraged to supplement with 150 micrograms of iodine per day. And that is part of a prenatal or should be part of a prenatal multivitamin. So you can verify a look at the one day brand and it was present in this amount. So I would assume that most prenatals have at least 150 micrograms of iodine as well. Also, it's important to, to notice um, to mention that many parts of the world do not have enough iodine available through their diet. So some experts say that there's about 30% of the world's population that are at risk for iodine deficiency. So it's a public health issue. So it's not something that just vegans and vegetarians may face, um, but there's a large part of the world's population that faces um, possible deficiency as well. Um, to test if somebody could potentially be deficient before you develop those clinical signs, uh, you can do the urinary uh, urine tests, and you can measure if the urinary iodine concentration is less than 100 micrograms per liter in a non-pregnant population or less than 150 micrograms per liter in a population of pregnant women. Those are indications of deficiency, and a supplement should be started or a regular source of iodine. And this information comes from the Office of Dietary Supplements and the American Thyroid Association. Any questions on iodine before we switch, switch gears to the last nutrient? No? Okay, so vitamin B12, I think this is the one maybe most people who follow a vegan or vegetarian diet have heard or have looked into. It's a vitamin that is required for the development and maintenance of the central nervous system. Uh, it's involved in DNA and red blood cell synthesis. Also functions, functions as a cofactor for enzymes that are involved in the synthesis of the essential amino acid methionine that is required for many processes in the body. And is also required for the production of the short chain fatty acid called propionate, which is a substance linked to many health benefits including the reduction of storage of fat in the body, reduction of cholesterol levels, and even reduction of cancer, more particularly colon cancer. So the daily recommendations of B12, I'm gonna look at my daily needs, 2.4 microgram. What are some of the sources of B12? 
Um, it's naturally present in some foods uh, from animal sources, but keep in mind those animals, they're not producing B12, they're actually getting from microbes in the soil. So because animals, you know, are eating things sometimes in contact with the soil, um, that's where they get the B12 from. But because we don't do that, we actually wash our produce um, in, in the water, you know, is also chlorinated. So we don't have that um, exposure to the B12 microbes in the soil. So we can either get it, if you're not consuming animal foods, you can either get it from fortified foods, such as some plant, plant-based dairy substitutes, nutritional yeast, which is a product, as a product some of us may use um, to make some preparations. There are two forms, some of the nutritional yeast, uh, one of them is not fortified, another one is, so you need to, again, refer to the label. Some types of meat analogs and meat substitutes can also be fortified, but not all of them. So always refer to the label if that's one of your sources of B12. Dietary supplements is the other source and also prescription. So for those who are deficient, the doctor may require, may recommend a higher dose. And then sometimes it may, you may need to administer in the form of a shot. So B12 can be prescribed in those conditions as well. Um, I'm of a belief that I think is wise to use a supplement. So that's the one we buy at home. Keep in mind that Nature Made, they offer the B12 in the form of tablets or soft gels. The soft gels uses gelatin, which is you know, made out of collagen from bovine or from pigs. So you wanna be careful that you look for the tablets. And if you wanna double check, you can look at the label and the ingredients to make sure you don't find any gelatin uh, on the supplement. In terms of how much to supplement, you can refer to this recommendation um, by a source that I consider very reputable, very scientifically based, Dr. Michael Greger from his website, nutritionfacts.org. So he has this chart with a recommendation on how much and how often to supplement. Um, so you can use this as a reference. So groups that are at risk of B12 deficiency, vegans and vegetarians, but also older adults. So those who are older than 50 years old, also they are more at risk. Those suffering from pernicious anemia, those with um, atrophic gast gastritis, other, also other gastrointestinal disorders such as Crohn's disease, celiac disease, individuals who had gastrointestinal surgeries such as stomach reduction, individuals also with diabetes that are taking a medication called metformin, or also known as glucophage. All of those conditions are involved in risk for B12 deficiency. So I recommend you test your B12 at least once a year or more often as needed. Not only the serum B12, I recommend to test your methylmalonic acid in your homocysteine, which are two substances that use B12 as a coenzyme in the metabolic processes. So if those are elevated, they indicate that your B12 is low, even before the deficiency is gonna show in the serum B12, which is the most common blood test that is ordered. So it's something that you can inform your doctor, you know, if you're doing your regular annual checkup, you can say, hey, I wanna test my B12, but I also wanna test my methylmalonic acid and my homocysteine, just to, you know, be covered that your B12 is not too low. So what is the take home message? It, sound, it may sound complicated to keep you know, track of all these things, but the reality is a healthy diet requires planning. And that goes for whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or whether you eat meat and you wanna try to be the healthiest meat eater you can. So it's gonna require planning. And that's something that also we've been given advice on the book Councils on Diet and Foods, where Eloma says that to keep the body in a healthy condition in order that all parts of the living machinery may act harmoniously should be the study of our life. So it's something that is never gonna end, but it's something that gets easier and easier as we understand and as we put those things into practice. So I hope this was helpful. Um, in terms of a resource each month, I like to highlight a resource 
So I'd like to highlight the work of Dr. Brooke Goldner. She has had a lot of work with uh, reversing autoimmune diseases because she was able to reverse her lupus with a plant-based diet. So she has her work in the website, goodbyelupus.com. Uh, she also just released a book, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease, that you can find on Amazon. And I don't get any financial compensation from those things that I, I'm showing in this presentation, by the way. Just to be clear, those are all you know, resources that I've been exposed to that I think may be helpful to you guys. All right, so we have also an exciting, exciting announcement. We have, we're going to have a Joy of Eating contest that is going to be running from today until next month's presentation. It's helpful if you join our Facebook page, the Joy of Eating Club, but if you're not a Facebook person, that's totally fine. You would have then to send what you're creating to Phil, to his email. So the contest is going to involve posting the pictures of the dish that you'll be making between today and our next meeting that features either a vegetable you never tried before or any foods highlighted in today's presentation along with the recipe or a description on how you made it. And the prize, uh, we're going to select the winner during our next Joy of Meeting presentation in October. And the prize is going to be the same coffee grinder that I have, and I, I shouldn't say coffee grinder, I call it flaxseed grinder. So uh, next time I'm gonna Photoshop this coffee out of here, uh, if I can do that, but I call it flaxseed grinder because that's the only purpose I have this thing is my flaxseed grinder. So you're gonna have the same one if you win the contest. And so you can start participating starting today. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, do we have any questions left, Phil, before I switch gears to Chef Nick? Yeah, so real quick, I just want to say you can't help it if Hamilton Beach misuses the flaxseed grinder. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> and we had we had one question. Donna was wondering, how do you put the mushrooms in the sun? And so I I'm wondering if you know like how the manufacturers or, or the growers do it. And if could could I like when I buy mushrooms, could I put them out in the sun in order to get more vitamin D in there? Do you know? That's a very good question. I'm gonna have to answer you next time because I didn't look into this detail. So I don't wanna just guess um, on how do they do it, but I'll get the answer to you. Or maybe I can research as Nick is presenting uh, his dish and I'll look it up and I'll give you the answer to that. And then um, we also got the question, is there ever a need to grind chia seeds? I know that it's a good idea to grind flax seeds, but what about chia seeds? Yeah, so you can have an additional benefit too, but flax seed tends to be a little softer, the shell. Uh, of the seed, so um, you don't necessarily need as much as flaxseed, but you would get a little bit more if you grind it just because you're breaking into, you know, you're exposing more surface of the seeds into smaller uh, pieces. So technically it's gonna be facilitating the absorption, but it's a softer seed, so you can still get a, a significant amount without having to grind it. Any other questions? Not in the chat. All right, so thank you so much for your attention. Let us know your thoughts when once the feedback survey is released.